I'd like to start off with kind of explaining to you about the National Wildlife Refuge System. You fall National Wildlife Refuge is, is part of the Department of the Interior, which within the Fish and Wildlife Service, within the National Wildlife Refuge System. What is the National Wildlife Refuge System is probably best summed up in what our mission statement is. And this mission statement comes from a an act that was passed by Congress in 1997. Previous to that, we did not have any organic legislation or the refuge system that kind of defined what we were as a, as a group of, uh, of refuges. And I'll just read it to you. It's to administer a national network of lands and waters for the conservation, management, where appropriate restoration of the fish, wildlife, and plant resources and their habitats within the United States for the benefit of present and future generations of Americans. So a, a, a rather you know, broad statement. <coughs> the, the first refuge was established in 1903 by President Roosevelt. It was a small island in Florida. It was called Pelican Island. And it was our, our very first refuge. The ref Pelican Island was established essentially out of necessity. There was a lot of hunting going on for water birds and the fashion industry and he protected Pelican Island as a way of protecting habitat for those birds. Since then, the refuge has, has grown quite a bit. We now have 553 refuges. There's uh, 150 million acres within the refuge system. We have 41 million visitors a year. We have about a $500 million annual budget and we have a staff nationwide of about 5,000 people. As I mentioned before, the 1997 Improvement Act did some fairly important things for the refuge system. Up until that time, we were a system, and there was legislation passed by Congress that, that concerned the management of the refuge system, but we didn't have that organic legislation that kind of coalesced us as, as a group and essentially what the Improvement Act did was it defined that we would be managed as a system it affirmed that wildlife management wildlife conservation was a first priority for refuges it identified six priority public uses that we were to encourage on refuges it defined a couple of terms that are important to us in the refuge system, which is appropriate and compatible. Essentially, it, it defined what those terms meant and said that if an activity was going to occur on a refuge, it would have to be appropriate and compatible with why the refuge was established. And what happened for us recently within the past five years was it required that every refuge develop a comprehensive conservation plan so that each refuge would have direction, very defined direction for about 15 years. You follow a National Wildlife Refuge, which is, which is us, is, is kind of a unique refuge. A lot of times refuges are established out of a need for endangered species habitat or to reclaim an area that was heavily degraded by some activity. But in 1964, the local community here in Eufaula felt like with the establishment of the, or the construction of the dam and establishment of the reservoir, that a refuge would be an important thing for the area, an important thing for the community. So this refuge was essentially established by the community. And it's, it's kind of neat to have such community support in a refuge. There's 
a little over 11,000 acres on the refuge, of about 4,000 acres of that is, is open water on Lake Eufaula. And we have a variety of habitats on the refuge, all the way from the riparian areas down along the river, on up into some, some upland areas. And as you can see, the, the red areas on this map are our boundary. The white areas are roads. And you can kind of see that a lot of the area that we have is, is riparian. But we were established essentially for migratory waterfowl habitat and water bird habitat. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. And also, we're... If you look at the secretarial agreement that established the refuge, we are to provide recreation as well, or provide opportunities for recreation as long as they fit into our wildlife management mission. And those have to be wildlife oriented activities. When you should visit, there's lots of good times to visit. You follow, it depends on the time of year. In the winter, we have a huge number of waterfowl down. It's a wonderful time to go out and look at uh, the various waterfowl species we get through here. It's a very diverse group. I think that uh, we had close to 13 different species of waterfowl this year. In the springtime, you've got the cold-blooded critters that are coming out, sitting on the side of the road sometimes in the evening, trying to soak up a little bit of heat. Summer can get a little bit brutal. A little bit humid, but there's lots of amphibians out. There's there's nesting birds. There's quail. It's quite an interesting place. In the fall, we get migratory shorebirds will be through the area. A lot of neotropical migrants will also be passing through the refuge on their way to South America. What we call the big six are hunting, fishing, wildlife observation, wildlife photography, environmental education, and environmental interpretation. This is what the National Wildlife Refuge Improvement Act indicated that we should be concentrating on when it comes to recreation on refuges. And so when you come out to the refuge, it's not quite like a national park in that it's not recreation for recreation's sake. Yes, we love to get people out of doors and on bicycles, but most of the recreation that we like to see on refuges is oriented toward wildlife and these big six net, uh, big six recreational uses. Next slide. Hunting, we've got a fairly substantial hunting program on the refuge. We offer waterfowl hunting. I think we've probably got some of the best public hunts in the state. Uh, we're very much in demand. We do it by a lottery system. And the hunters, they love us to death. It's, it's a really good hunt. It's a very easy hunt. It's a, it's a good hunt to bring uh, children to. We also have dove hunts. We have some youth dove hunts, some youth deer hunts, also some small game hunting opportunity. Fishing's pretty easy. We're just open year round according to the state regulations. There are lots of opportunities for shore fishing that we provide. We have some pump stations in, uh, oh, about three weeks ago, we were trying to dewater our waterfowl impoundments. And when we pump this water out of our impoundments and into the lake, it's a magnet for fish. And we get lots of calls from people all the time. So if you started the pumps, if you started the pumps, it's a, if you don't have a boat, it's a great place to come and, and spend some time fishing. We don't specifically have any photography areas set up. It, it, wildlife photography is kind of a hard thing. It, it takes a special person to be able to do that. It's, it's, it's difficult, if not more difficult, than hunting. But there are wonderful opportunities out on the refuge if you're patient or just lucky. Next slide. Right in hand with that is, is wildlife observation. We have a couple of observation platforms or towers on the refuge, one of which is handicapped accessible. Beautiful areas that overlook some of our managed areas as well as some of the, 
the natural bottomlands along the river. We have a wildlife drive that's a couple, three miles long. If you don't have much time, I suggest morning or evening, but you can very easily come out to the refuge, follow the signs. We don't have an interpretive panel or areas where you can, that will kind of describe the area, but you can, and particularly in the mornings and the evenings, if you get out, there's lots of interesting things that you'll see. You never know what you're gonna run into on the refuge from water moccasins on up to great horned owls. The environmental education and interpretation program at the refuge is, is very small at this point. We're, we're not a large staff. We, we are trying to fill a position for an education specialist that specifically will go into the schools, um, Boy Scout groups, church groups, whoever really wants a little bit of a program on the, on the refuge, the refuge system, the natural environment in general. Doing talks like this, but we do offer a, a, a few programs. Our, as, I, as I mentioned, we are kind of small. We have six permanent staff, and hopefully we'll get to fill this term education specialist position. Some of our current management programs, we have a lot of a lot of the stuff we do is oriented toward waterfowl and waterfowl management. We have a, an agricultural program that we handle ourselves. We have some managed wetlands, which is semi-farming, where we encourage natural vegetation by manipulating the soil and the water and the time of year that we do, we do certain things to try to encourage the vegetation that we're trying to get. We do some burning. We have, uh, I guess, warm season grass fields, fallow, old farm fields that we burn, that we manage, trying to encourage that type of early successional habitat. And kind of the new thing for us is longleaf pine management. When we went through our CCP process about five years ago, we weren't really sure what the historic habitat was at Eufaula. There was some debate whether it was longleaf pine, if it should have been loblolly, possibly slash, hardwoods. I think the, I wasn't there at the time, I'm fairly new at this refuge. The biologists and the experts with the state and with our regional office in Atlanta came to the conclusion that it was, in all likelihood, the very tops, the very sandy tops was longleaf pine. And because this is a habitat of some concern right now throughout the southeast, we determined, we made the decision that we would concentrate on longleaf pine management and try to get the functional value of that habitat back on the refuge, or at least to about a thousand acres on the refuge. And I'm sure Alabama forestry owners, that a lot of this is not new information to you. There's not much longleaf pine left. <coughs> the, the species that depend on that type of habitat are, are in short supply just like the habitat is. And so what we're doing is we're trying to get that back on the refuge. Just here recently, we've restored about a thousand acres of longleaf pine. And if you come out on the tour today, you'll see areas that we've burned, areas that we've planted. Some of them were formerly mixed hardwoods. Some of them were loblolly stands. Some of the areas were agricultural fields. We're trying to get that longleaf wiregrass community back on those tops at the, at the refuge. And you'll also notice that we've done some burning. One of the, one of the hard decisions for us was what do we do with the loblolly? Do we clear cut it? Do we leave some of the loblolly there to at least mimic the historic value of the longleaf pine? The decision was made to leave some of the loblolly. Well, that's kind of created a problem for us in that we've got tons of little loblolly out there that are competing with our longleaf pine. So we've done some early, hopefully hot burning to set back the loblolly and encourage the the longleaf pine. And you, if you come out today, you'll see some of that.
this is this is kind of why the refuge was established was migratory waterfowl back in the 60s it was it was as important as longleaf pine is today so a lot of the things that you'll see on the refuge are oriented toward water management and waterfowl management. in order to, to to do justice to, to water bird management and wetland management, having as much water control as possible is, is very important. We have a huge number of pumping stations on the refuge. We invest a lot of time and money in maintaining and operating those, those water structures. But without that ability to control water, it makes it very difficult to fulfill our obligations. This is one of our pump stations here. It's a diesel-powered unit. We use a lot of diesel throughout the year managing our weapons. We do some wood duck box work out on the refuge. If you get out, you'll see a few. If you're out in the boat, you'll see some. We get pretty good use on the refuge. Lots of wood duck boxes. Recently, we used to do a cooperative farming program where we had a local farmer come in, uh, conduct farming, and in payment for using the refuge, we got to keep about 20% of the crop that was usually left in the field for the wildlife. With the longleaf pine coming back in to the, to the picture for the refuge, we had more acres in agriculture than we felt that we needed. We wanted to put those back in the longleaf. What that meant was that we would have to take over the farming ourselves. We kind of got geared up to do that. We now have a fairly, at least for us, a fairly substantial farming program, but we get to keep all the crop now and we leave it in the field for the, for the critters. A lot of the stuff that we plant, sunflowers, corn, milo on occasion, millet's a pretty easy thing to plant. Um, corn obviously being the most expensive, but it also gives us the biggest bang for the buck. We can produce more calories on a smaller uh, patch of ground with corn. This is the, the moist soil management. This is what I was talking about earlier. When we kind of manipulate the soil, we may go in and scratch it with a disc. We may burn it. We may not do anything to it, uh, except leave it dry until July and then use our pump stations to put water in it. And all these different combinations will give you a different suite of native vegetation out in the impoundment. So we figure out what the combination is, which is really an art more than a science, and then we try to do that each year to encourage the vegetation that we want and discourage the, the, that vegetation that we don't. The vegetation that we don't. I'm sure that a lot of you deal with many of these very same species. It costs us a lot on the refuge, particularly alligator weed and some of the sesbanias. makes it very difficult for us to manage on the refuge. We do use a lot of herbicides trying to keep up with these. Not always successful. These are some of our upland species that we have to deal with. And some of the aquatic species that we uh, that we have to deal with. These are this is actually an impoundment that once it gets dry, we'll probably put it back to corn or milo. Unfortunately, this is wonderful habitat for alligator weed. So there's a lot of difficulties in managing or farming poor wildlife. Fire management, very key. Longleaf pine is a, obviously a, a fire-driven species that longleaf wiregrass community is a fire community. You'll see some where we burn on the refuge. Burning is going to get to be a, a big part of what we do on the refuge now that we've kind of converted to longleaf pine. Just this spring we burned 200 acres. That'll be obvious when, when you're out on the refuge. We plan to get in the habit of burning three to 500 acres each year. Last year we burned about 800 acres of warm season grass fields that we had planted some 
native Lespedesias and other vegetation out on the refuge, trying to encourage that, that component of the historic ecosystem. Very difficult for us to do this on our own. We work with the Corps of Engineers, we work with Ducks Unlimited, we partner up. They have expertise that we don't have. They have equipment that, that we don't have. And we can work with NGOs, non-government organizations, and other government organizations to help us fulfill our obligations and our mission here at the Refuge. And you can go through these next four slides fairly quickly. The Bradley unit, which is on the Georgia side, this shows the whites, levees, the red is a new levee. Next slide. And with the help of the Corps of Engineers and Ducks Unlimited, we went in, engineered, and gave us a little bit more control over the water. On the Alabama side, this is essentially what we had to work with, which was a several hundred acre patch. It's very hard to work with a large patch like that, so Ducks Unlimited came in and did some engineering for us and divided it up into pieces that we can work with. Next slide. What we're looking at now at Ufala is new projects maybe to pare down or to section up some of those large units into manageable sized pieces. We always have a need on the refuge to do one more good thing for wildlife, so we're always pursuing opportunities for partnering for funding or for staff expertise. Always looking for volunteers on the refuge. We're looking at, we've got this big plan that kind of outlines what we're doing for the refuge, but we need to do some step down management plans, a timber management plan, a farm management plan to help us better identify exactly where we're going and to give the public an opportunity to look at what we're doing and to comment on what we're doing. Uh, a big part of what we're doing now is, is monitoring how successful we are. And if we're successful, great to continue on. If we're not quite getting the, the effects that we want is to tweak our management and adapt it and, and head off in a different direction. And then a big thing that's really affecting the Fish and Wildlife Service right now as an agency is climate change. There's a lot of uncertainty, but we need to prepare as best we can now. And that was kind of a, a little bit of a driving force be, behind our plan to go to Longleaf Pine, is that if the climate continues to change, that the we might lose some of the longleaf pine that's in Florida, and the, the conditions that are suitable for longleaf might be creeping north, which would put you fall in an excellent position, a refuge in an excellent position, to be able to provide that important habitat in the, in the future, considering climate change. 